so uh, there's a lot of different training philosophy. There's a, there's a lot of different training schools. But the bottom line is, is any person that tries to modify another sentient being's behavior, do invertebrates count as sentient beings? Mm -hmm. I think they do. Karen Pryor clicker trained a hermit crab, so. <laughs> I didn't want to leave out the hermit crab, because the hermit crab rang a bell, and it was awesome. Um, so, uh, um, if you attempt to modify another sentient being's behavior, you are using operant conditioning on some level. So B.F. Skinner identified operant conditioning. It's, it's principles of learning is what operant conditioning is. We fall under them, as do other sentient beings. And so there are four quadrants of operant conditioning, and which kind of trainer you are is determined by which of those quadrants you are willing to use. And so the four quadrants are positive reinforcement. And by the way, the term positive is mathematical. So it doesn't mean good, it means you're adding something. So there's positive reinforcement, which means you're adding something to increase the frequency of the behavior in the future. Positive punishment is you're adding something to decrease the occurrence of behavior in the future. So that's a shock collar, that's a spray bottle, that's a shake can, that's a loud no. Negative reinforcement, you're taking something away to increase the future occurrence of behavior. Um, in traditional dog training, they have a dumbbell exercise where dogs have to pick up a metal dumbbell, which most dogs don't appreciate because metal tastes gross. And one of the most traditional ways they used to train it was they squeezed the dog's ear, they pinched the dog's ear, and when the dog was willing to hold on to the dumbbell, they let go. And that's negative reinforcement. That is the correct face to have. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and what did I leave out? Negative, negative punishment. punishment. Negative punishment is when you take something away to decrease the likelihood of future behavior. That can be something as simple as a back turn. So if your dog jumps up and you turn your back, you are taking your tension away with the goal of decreasing the frequency of future behavior, that is negative punishment. So there are these four principles. And as I said, which kind of trainer you are is really determined by which of those quadrants you're comfortable using. So I am, um, so anyone could technically call themselves a science-based trainer because they're using scientifically validated principles of B.F. Skinner to train. Um, I am a compassion-based trainer, so I don't use pain, I don't use the threat of pain, I don't use force, because I find that that's, that's a quick way to shut an animal down. And I want an animal that's trying stuff, because animals that try stuff are animals that are successful with us, right? So that's what we're all about. Now what's interesting about clicker training is it's a technology, and all that basically means is it's Rec replicable, right? A lot of people can do it. You can do it with a lot of different animals. Again, um, dogs, cats, bunnies. Did not know you could do it with a hermit crab until Husbands. Karen Pryor did it. And <laughs> 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 she, uh, she didn't use a clicker, because I'm not sure hermit crabs have ears. I'm not sure how that works. I'm really ignorant about hermit crabs, actually. What she used as a marker instead were the tips of the forceps shaking in the water. So when the crab did what she was waiting for, which was actually swinging up and hitting a string, she shook the forceps and then dropped a little piece of shrimp. And so the shaking of the forceps became the marker. So there's nothing special about the sound of the clicker. What we're using is an event marker. So I really quickly just kind of want to go over what an event marker is about. Because dolphin trainers use whistles. It's easier, your hands are free. You can choose to use a whistle. Right? You can use a word, you don't have to use a clicker. So, question for you, anyone have any idea how quickly you have to present a potential reinforcer, like a treat, or a ball being thrown, or a leash saying we're gonna go for a walk, how quickly you have to deliver it for the sentient being you're delivering it to to associate it with the behavior. So what I mean by that is, let's say you want to give a dog a treat for sitting. The dog's butt hits the ground. How long do you have to treat the dog? 
actually, it's got the treat's got to hit their mouth. For the dog to know it's for sitting. Three seconds. Anyone else want to guess? Two seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> Three seconds. Two seconds. Anyone else? Two seconds. How many? Okay. So uh, we've we three and below, right? Three and below. Are you Thirty-three you? nanoseconds. Okay. I, I like that you went to nanoseconds. Too. I like that. Um, you have three seconds at the most. And actually, by the third second, your feedback is 81% weaker. You gotta be fast. This is a problem, right? Because we're not fast, right? It's like, I'm trying to open the bag, right? You're trying to get stuff. So you gotta be really, really, really fast. And this became really obvious, this time situation, um, when they were training dolphins. Because the dolphins were leaping in the air and landing, and then swimming over to get their reward. And in really short order, the dolphins got confused. Well, they didn't get confused. <laughs> they thought they were being trained something other than what they were being trained. So the handlers said, oh, I'm giving you this fish for leaping through the air. But the dolphin said, well, the last thing I was doing before you gave me the fish was swimming up to you. So they stopped leaping. Because they were like, well, where's the trainer? I think I get a fish for just coming up to you, right? So the trainers were like, huh, this is a problem. Right? This is a problem. And it was just confusion and timing. That's all it was. But you got kind of- shotting the fish didn't work. That's the problem, right? We have a logistics issue. How are you going to deliver this fish midair? That's going to be, and slingshot is on the table, right? But you gotta, you gotta be pretty good at it. And something tells me if you beamed the dolphin wrong, it could be a punisher, right? So the dolphin could be like, I'm never jumping again. There's flying fish, right, that hit me, right? So that's got a potential for big time disaster. So um, they decided to go back to Pavlov, who's way cool. And Pavlov taught us, you know what? We can pair a sound with something really good so many times that the sound causes anticipation so intense for what's coming that in a dog it's drool. Um, I don't know if dolphins drool. I'll say I don't. Um, and I don't believe Pavlov had any in his lab. It was pretty cold in Russia back then. I don't, I don't think so. Um, so <clears throat> what they did is they paired whistle with fish. And they paired it so much that when they blew the whistle, the dolphin would pop the head up and go, Where, where's the fish? So it was clear the dolphin understood, when I hear this sound, something really good's gonna come. And then they just waited, because dolphins are known to leap, right? <laughs> and when the dolphin left, they blew the whistle midair. So when the dolphin was actually flying in the air, it got the information. What you're doing right now is gonna earn you your fish. Oh, so then when I land and swim over, I'm getting a fish that I actually got for something that happened, you know, 30, 45 seconds ago. So the use of a marker added huge efficiency to training because it added clarity to training. Clarity for the animal being trained, right? Now here's what's really cool about using a marker. And again, there's nothing special about a clicker. You can use a whistle. I have some clients that click with their tongues. You can use a word. The only problem with words, especially when you're dealing with domestic animals, maybe not so much with dolphins, <laughs> is they hear human voices all the time. So a word isn't as salient to them. It doesn't stand out in the same way that a burst of a little whistle does or a click does. But you can still use a word. So what is so beautiful about a marker is you don't have to have any personal relationship with the animal you're training to convey really important information. And in fact, your role as conveyor of this really important information is what builds the relationship. That's the foundation it stands on because all of a sudden, you become a resource. You're like a new water hole or berry patch, right? So if you're, wild, if you're like a bear and you're out looking for stuff and you notice a new berry patch, you're gonna take intense interest in it, right? Because this is gonna feed you. So when you are clicker training, all of a sudden you become a resource. 
and the dog takes tremendous interest in you, right? And you are conveying information with a click that enables that dog to view the world in a different way because now they're an active agent in that world. And it's their decisions, not you, their decisions that cause the click. Right? When I make good decisions, the click happens. Um, that is the beauty of the clicker. It buys you time. And how much time it buys you depends on the dog's experience with the clicker. So when I'm starting with a new dog, like right now when I'm teaching the dog this click means sound, I try to get it in three seconds because not much is going on. It's just like click, 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 click. But when I'm using it to, oh, that was a good decision <coughs> click, you know, you have five to ten seconds. And with my, my dogs are so clicker savvy now, I could probably click and a minute later deliver something. But the key here, by the way, with using a marker is you just use it to teach new behaviors. Right? So it's not like you have to click for the rest of the dog's life. Right? Once a dog understands what they're getting clicked for, so let's say I start clicking this dog for sitting. Whenever it sits, I don't ask for it. I don't do anything to get it. It just makes a good decision, I click and treat. I start clicking and treating for sits. And the dog says, huh, I think I'm getting, thank you, clicked for sitting. It starts coming over to me and sitting, right, and saying, hey, you going to pay me for this? Is this why I'm getting treated? Well, at that point, the dog fully understands what we're working on. Right now, I'm just clicking for orienting towards me. You pay attention to me, I click, right? I do nothing for it. I'm not calling the dog. The dog has other options, could do anything else in this room. Dog's mom is in this room. Dog does not have to make eye contact. Just has to turn head my way. And keep in mind that with many shelter dogs, their relationship with human beings is complicated. Don't expect eye contact. Prolonged eye contact is pretty rude in the dog world. It's a precursor to a fight often. And so when I first start walking, working with dogs on this, it's like, hey, if you just choose to orient towards me, I'll pay you. So that dog orienting towards everyone else in this room didn't pay, but orienting towards me did, <laughs> right? So my hope is that I'm gonna start seeing more orientation towards me. Now, I could be handing the dog the treat one of the reasons why I'm throwing it is because when I throw it, the dog has to look away from me to get the treat, which gives the dog another opportunity to turn and look at me, right? So I'm throwing the treat so that the dog gets more repetitions in, but I don't have to, right? That's just a, that's a training decision that I happen to make in this moment. <laughs> So what I had to do was figure out what was important to her. And what was important to her was meeting people and new smells. Okay, so you pay attention to me, click, you can go smell that deer poop. You pay attention to me, click, you can go say hi to that new person. Yeah, you don't want my cheese? Cool, I'll work with other stuff. My bet is here, one of the big rewards you have and the big reinforcers you have is getting out of the building, right? Fresh air. Okay, well, let's work for that. Oh, you pay attention to me? Click. I open the door. Let's go for a walk. Or you're insane because you see that I have a leash. You really want me to let you out? Well, cool. I'll wait for some comp. Oh, <laughs> four paws on the ground. Click. I'll lean forward with the leash. Oh, you jump. Mm -hmm. Leash stops. Oh, you're calm again? Click. I'll leave. Oh, you figured that out? I'll click again and get a little closer. Oh, you stay calm? I'll click and attach the leash. Now, I know it's going to take 20 repetitions. Right, because I know the first 10 times you lean forward with the leash, the dog's going to go, Ooh. right, so it's just absolutely, it's okay, it's your willingness to say, you know what, this leash is a meatball, and you earned it, right, and here's the thing, one of my goals is that when people think about getting a new dog, they think of the SPCA as having the coolest dogs imaginable not the damaged dogs. I have four months, <laughs> okay, so, um, and the husky was a rescued blood husky. 
who looked a lot like a husky and acted like a husky, who knows what her, I actually wish she had some hound in her, would have made her much more dealable. But anyway, <laughs> she was an awesome dog. Um, so, you know, I, I, because I have the privilege of working with so many dogs, some of them, many of them purebred, many of them mutts, I know that the pedigree isn't what makes an awesome dog. I know that. That's why I have mutts in my house, right? Because it's all about the spirit, right? And here's the thing. This kind of training taps into that and helps a dog be all that it can be. And those are the dogs that not only get adopted, but stay in homes, right? Because we want dogs to go into homes and say, hey, you know what? I've learned at my little stay at the Charlottesville SPCA that if I make good decisions, it pays. And so even though I really want to jump on the counter because there's rotisserie chicken there, <laughs> I think that I've been paid a lot better for keeping four paws on the ground. Maybe I should do that instead. Yeah, you should, right? But here's the thing. That doesn't take 10 practices. That takes 100. <laughs> that takes every single person has to be consistent with the dog. If some people, the dog can jump up and still gets a leash attached and goes for a walk, but some people are asking for polite behavior, that dog doesn't know what the rules are. So that dog's just going to keep trying cuckoo stuff, right? So the key is you need to create a history for the dog so they understand what the rule is before you add a huge amount of excitement. And I, I say this about dogs that jump up on people, and we're going to talk about jumping up dogs and why dogs do it shortly. I have human beings practice with their own dogs for a week, trying to get the dog to jump up any way they can, holding food up, holding toys up, trying, jump up, jump up. So if you do, guess what? I can turn my back. But if you don't, I'll deliver the goodie. So the dog gets this huge history with you of learning, oh, I see, even though I really want to jump. If I don't jump, it pays, but boy, if I do, it doesn't. So then, when they're meeting someone new, they've had some practice at the expected behavior. And I tell people, start clicking and treating your dog for four paws on the ground before they even notice the person coming towards them. Because the person coming towards them is a distraction, right? So I'm gonna start rewarding the behavior I want before the distraction's even there. So then when the person shows up, the dog's not only had a week or two of learning from me that jumping up doesn't pay, they've had 30 or 40 seconds of, boy, keeping my four paws on the ground really pays. Maybe I'll do it when this person shows up, right? So when you're saying no, 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 and you're shutting off all these behaviors, you're not giving it any behavior it can do. And it's gonna do something. Unless it's dead, it's going to do something, right? The only dog that isn't moving is a dead dog. So if you concentrate your energies not on stop, 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 but yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. It not only changes the dog, it changes you. It changes who you are. And not just with dogs. You're going to look at the... Tell her at the checkout counter differently. Yeah. Oh, I like that nail polish. I mean, like, <laughs> you literally, you start sprinkling it all around. It's like, I got something good to say about you. So, are we charged? Yeah, he's charged. Okay, who, who wants to work? Now, this is going to be critical, you audience members. I want to work on orienting towards who's ever clicking and treating, which means that Anyone else in this room doesn't pay. So, if I'm up there, or who's ever, whatever victim I may volunteer, we choose, <coughs> to click and treat for this. And Head, why don't you start doing some orientation oh, yeah. training? If the dog chooses to come out here, I don't want it to pay. I don't want it not to, I mean, I don't want it to be bad. I'm not gonna say no, I'm not gonna say, oh, get off. I just want, oh, no payment over here, no payment. Boy, this person with the clicker pays. I guess I'm going to start really concentrating my efforts and energy on that person. So you guys need to be relatively boring. Who wants to try it? 
Come on down. Lauren. All right, Lauren. <laughs> now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to let this dog know who you are. Yeah, and you're going to be breaking off. Yeah, like, don't be crazy about it. <laughs> you, well, I take that back. You can do it anyway you want to. <laughs> you can be crazy about it. So get like 10 in. So this dog knows. So again, even though the markers probably, the dog probably knows when I hear this out, I'm going to get a treat. This is a new person. How is this person relevant to me? So just by doing 10 click treats, click treats, click treats, she's letting this dog know, I'm someone you might want to interact with. I've got important information for you, and it pays. Right. So what I try to do when I first meet a dog who doesn't know me at all is take 10 clicks and treats to say, I think you might find me interesting. Mm -hmm. I think you might find that I have information that will help be helpful to you. Now, if I work with this dog two or three days in a row, this dog knows me, this dog sees me come and he goes, ah, oh, you're the clicker woman, I'm going to sit. Yeah. yeah, then I don't have to reestablish that, right? But when I'm first, and especially in an environment that's got a lot of chaos and a lot of faces, one of the things I want to establish for this dog is, boy, you people have these clicks, and they really seem to pay. And so when this dog sees any person, even prospective adopters, the dog goes, hey, you got some information for me? Because I've, I've learned a lot of people around here do, and it's pretty cool, right? So, and it doesn't have to happen every single time, right? So it's not like the adopter has to show up because the dog's going to still try. Anytime the dog sees a person, they're going to be, you one of those clicker carrying people? <laughs> I think it's really cool if you are, right? Who wants to come up and train for attention? You're going to be doing this in the real world. Hey, we're totally nice. <laughs> look, at the, look at the feedback everyone's getting. We've been positive and fun. Oh, we've got a ringer. It came with a clicker. <laughs> I'll show you. And so you can throw it. The dog's just right. there. You go. Have drop the leash. Let's see what this dog decides to do. <laughs> so one of the things I really want to quickly teach dogs, especially so, this is this dog has other choices, right? Just ignore. <laughs> Any orientation towards you. Yeah, I <laughs> so this is when people start saying, no, 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 no. This dog's already pretty excited, right? Already pretty like, Ooh, I think I'm at a party. I'm not sure whose it is. Might be mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you add energy by barking at this dog, it doesn't help, right? No, 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 no. The dog's like, oh, you're excited too. This is awesome. <laughs> Is this party for you? So again, dogs exploring the environment, I don't care, right? Explore it. There's great smells out there. The dog is getting something out there. I can't prevent that. But you come back into my realm, and that's good. You can throw the treat. Oh, he didn't see it. Oh, oh Robin it smells really good. Oh, it's right there. There you go. <coughs> Carla's feet. That was great. Really good clip. Notice how low her criteria is. This dog doesn't have to look at her. It's like, hey man, you come back in my orbit, I'll pay you. Right? Because now, this is a dog who thinks all orbits are pretty good. Right? That's great. I'm going to hedge my bets and make this orbit better. So we're not waiting for eye contact. We're just waiting for, can you get closer to me? Right? This dog doesn't know us from anyone, right? So it was a great click. And remember, they process the world through their nose, right? The olfactory system of a dog burns more calories than any other sense that they have. Smells are exhausting. 
Yeah, Sandy smells really good. <laughs> I'm gonna watch the dog's gonna get totally calm. Got a whiff of Sandy. <laughs> she makes me calm. I'm standing over next to her. Perfect. All right, now I'm out of treats. <laughs> That's okay, we're never out of treats. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> oh, good ball. It's on your toe. Right, one over here. Work with me now. And again, when you have dogs that have to deal with so many people, it's unrealistic to create, to wait for a personal relationship to be established before you can train. It's never going to happen, right? It takes time, but the clicker really quickly says it forms a personal relationship with anyone that's clicking, right? Because it's like, oh, you speak my language, right? You humans are kind of confusing, but man, there's this one thing you do that makes total sense to me, and I can work with that, right? That's lovely. Do you want to work on jumping up? What do you think about jumping up? You want to do tether or loose? You want to be the tether or you want me to be the tether? Okay. okay. Now, one of the things that I recommend, because you've got the jumping up issues in the kennels, you can work on the outside of the kennels before you go in. Um, but I'm going to show you what I like to do with dogs, so it helps if there's a pair of you. <laughs> so I added a little energy because the dog seemed to get it when I wasn't as energetic, right? Again, I'm not asking for a sit. If the dog wants to sit, that's fine. But I'm not asking for a sit. Hey, hey. Wow. That's so fun. What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, choked up the hot dog. I got a projectile to my back. Hi, baby. Hi. Brilliant. So you're asking him loud, just not to jump. More paws on the ground. So what's really cool about this, and this is a Patricia McConnell thing. If you haven't read any of Patricia McConnell's books, you must. She's a PhD. Don't let that discourage you. <laughs> no, she's delightful. She is delightful. The Other End of the Leash was her first sort of seminal book. She has all these um, little pamphlets, house training pamphlets. The Other End of the Leash is just lovely. And For the Love of a Dog is another book she wrote about animals and emotions. So good. So delightful and entertaining. And what she discovered was when you do this, and you start working on don't jump up, this becomes a hand signal to a dog not to jump. So when people are like, come on, jump up on me, dog, the dog's like, oh, no, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm to the so those rare people that inadvertently try to undermine your training just because, you know, my dog jumps up, I don't care. You know those people, and they're lovely, right? They're lovely. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Notice something else. Oh. I'm treating that. You hang out and do nothing, I will pay you. <laughs> this is what most people want their dog to do, and they never think to train it. That's true. No, seriously. That's true. I could make a million bucks if I had a training technique that just resulted in this like eight hours a day. <laughs> this is exactly what people want. Okay, so now Heather's going to try to jump up because we need new victims, right? Hi. Hi. Absolutely not. Now, here's what's critical. The more people this dog practices with, the less we're going to see the jumping up, right? So the only person that does this is Sandy. The dog's still going to jump up on everyone. <laughs> if everyone's in here, Heather's being goofy. Okay, who's going to get this dog to jump on him? Come on, people. Come on. We got, we got a victim there. You're a victim. You're coming up. Okay. 
Make sure you got it. Just a little piece of stuff. Okay. You start start making a didn't jump. So I click and click and yep. treat. That's okay. There you go. There you go. All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. You're in front of people, it's freaking you out. Don't worry. It's called the audience effect. Identified in 1904. You're cool. So, just, or 19 something. So, this, this is on film, and someone's going to see this and be like, it wasn't 1904, it was 1911. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, it's the audience effect. So, I just want you to take a deep breath. Part of the problem is you're holding your hands up so you're not breathing. So just, whew, just take a deep breath. So just kind of be a little goofy, and when he doesn't jump, click and treat. So try. Good, click, treat. Perfect. Click. Very good. So don't back away from him, because he's just going to keep coming forward. Move into him. Yeah, jump up on me, jump up on me. Click, treat. There we go. Click. Yeah. Treat. Good. Do another one. Uh, catcher. Like this dog catches. Yeah. This is a circus dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So you're gonna. That's what you snack, and I'll give you a treat. Okay. So give it a whirl. Hey, Rocco. Hi. Come on. Come on. Turn. Uh, turn your back. Ignore. Good. Turn back. Try again. Turn your back. Good. Really good. Turn back. Hey, buddy. Hi, come on. Click. Hi, come on. There you go. Good. Good boy. Try again. Come on. Hi. Click. Stay on your friend. It's fun. without a leash. Yeah, just keep turning your back, turning your back. Um, some dogs, you know, will jump on your back. So for those dogs, you want to start outside the kennel. Encourage them outside, four paws on, click, treat. So work outside the kennel before you go inside the kennel. And the thing is, if they're going to jump on your back, they're a candidate for saying, hey, will you help me work with this dog and get a partner, right? But if you got a dog you want to work solo with, one of the things that you can do after, let's say they've gotten really good. You know, you're doing this, you're and they're like, this is a setup and I'm not jumping, right? Which is exactly what you want them to think. You want them to think any human being begging them to jump up is setting them up, where's my meatball, I'm not jumping, right? You can then say, oh, well maybe you'll jump up for food. So Heather's going to have food in her hand. And if the dog jumps for it, she's just going to make a fist so he can't get it. She is not going to pull it away. Notice she didn't pull her hand away. Because that gets a snatching dog. I don't want a snatching dog. So it's, I'm holding it, you jump for it, I'll just make a fist, you can't get it. So what we're trying to teach this dog is there's going to be a lot of reasons you want to jump up, like the rotisserie chicken on the counter. <laughs> but we're going to give you all of this practice learning that no matter why you want to jump up, don't. I do this with toys too. You jump for a toy. I don't play with you. Right? You don't jump for the toy. I'll play with you. <laughs> Training and trying to get the dog to jump on you. Is there any issues with thinking down the line when you're trying to get a dog like to come to you? I mean, I guess typically you would say, versus. Well, notice we're not saying anything, right? So for starters, there's it's just motion, and I don't motion dogs to come to me this way. You might. No, I'm talking about more the words. Yeah. So we're not saying any words. Right? We're not, there's been no cues. Okay. Not one cue. Because here's the thing. This just happened in a class last night. <laughs> so it's very fresh in my mind. Um, a dog was barking and the human going, shh, 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 shh. The dog doesn't know the shh cue. And because she was shushing when the dog was barking, she was labeling barking. Shh, 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 shh. So what she's going to get in the future is shh, bark, bark, shh, bark. You know, it's like, heading down the wrong street, heading down the wrong street. Um, I don't have a cue for jumping off. 
So a lot of people have off or down, right? Off, down. The dog's gonna get off or down. But you gave it attention and you breathed on it. So it's gonna jump again, right? So I'm not concerned with getting down right now. I'm concerned with not jumping up at all in the future. That's what I'm after. So I don't label this because one of the things, this is where I think having a group of so many different people interacting with the dogs, who's using what cue? When are you using it? What is it? You know, no, you don't have to cue anything at all. Just click and treat. Click and treat a good decision. Click it. You don't have to name the good decision. You don't have to because here's the thing. You can micromanage a dog with cues. Right? You can impose control. And I have clients that just sit, sit, they're in the, you know, every two seconds they're telling the dog what to do. I have three dogs now. At one point I had four. There's multi-dog people in this room, many of you. Robin has 20. <laughs> so, um, Tara, always trying to build her pack. <laughs> um, but the bottom line is, is I can't micromanage my dogs. There's too many. So what I like to teach is make good decisions. You're on your own. And when you make them, I'll pay you, I'll make it worth your while. But make good decisions. So we're not even talking about a cue here. Now, I wanna talk about jumping up and why it's so hard to deal with and what it's really all about. How many people think dogs jump up because they're rude? Oh, you guys are totally not telling the truth. Come on. <laughs> no, they're excited and they wanna go out. Excited? <laughs> I know the answer to this question, Dad. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> There's two bumps in the roof of a dog's mouth. Cats have them too. I dare you to try this on the cat. <laughs> Apparently reptiles do too. I just found this out about snakes. Very cool. Um, and I'm not trying this with a snake. Uh, there, it's the bone row nasal organ. It's their social nose. It's vitally important. And because we don't see it, we don't tend to think about it. In fact, up until about 30 years ago, we thought it was extinct and it didn't work. And then we started cutting some out. <laughs> Mm. It turns out it's pretty important. Um, so, this, the primary job of the vomero nasal organ, it's also known as the Jacobian organ, is to process pheromones. There are two areas that are very rich in pheromones. Anyone want to guess what those are? Butt. Okay. We were definitive about that over here. <laughs> That would be the last name information. Somebody's been on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and where else? Mouth. Mouth, mouth, right? So when two dogs greet each other naturally, where do they concentrate the first 30 seconds that they meet each other? They make that circle, right? So it is their version of a handshake. And if you think about our version of a handshake, if I go up and shake your hand, it's a lot more complicated than two hands shaking, right? We're assessing facial expression, body carriage, energy, strength of the shake, right? There's kind of all of these determinations we're making from a handshake. The same thing is true of that. So when they're collecting pheromones from each other, they're getting information about sexual status, overall health, recent resources that they've gotten exposed to, and tons of stuff we don't understand at all. This is such a poorly understood organ. So, it's natural for a dog, when greeting, to say, I'm going to come get your pheromones. And notice, when they don't get them up here, where do they go next? Yeah. Right, right. So they're, they're getting those pheromones one way or another, right? So this is another reason why if you talk to a dog when they jump up, down, off, you have given them pheromones. You have, in fact, rewarded them for the move, right? And also, just in a general training rule of thumb, asking for another behavior after the inappropriate behavior has occurred or what you deem the inappropriate behavior has occurred doesn't change the inappropriate behavior, right? It's already happened, right? So, you know, so they'll get down, right? But it will, it will absolutely guarantee they jump again. That's why when he jumped up, I said, you know what? I'm taking my pheromones away. Oh, you didn't jump up? I not only treated him, I leaned down and said, what a great job you're doing, breath, right? So one of the things that I like to do with dogs that know me and are good at not jumping up is I lean down and talk to them. Hey, awesome, here's your meatball. <laughs> coming at you, coming at you. 
So this is also what we want to do with mouthing. So dogs explore the world with their mouth. And especially when you get youngsters in here, they're very mouthy. If you yip, yip, most dogs think you're playing. And they get even more hyped up. Right? They're like, oh, they're like little piranhas. Um, what I want you to do is, what they want to do is engage, right? I'm tugging on you because I want to play and I want to engage. And what you need to do is say, I actually don't play that way. So you just made a comment about that if it's a dog out and um, a lot of people make that yipping sound if he grabs at you. There's a lot of trainers out there that when they were younger, like they're puppies, you do that because that's how puppies, the puppies signal to one another. So you're saying that regardless of the age, if they're doing something you want, don't give them that sound, that yipping sound, because that excites them. Um, exactly. So uh, the bottom line is, dogs know you're not a dog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we don't sound like dogs when we yip. Although I will tell you, Patricia McConnell comes really close. I was hugely <laughs> impressed with Simon at first. I was like, okay, you can yip, right? So, but they know, and what it, what it is is it's engagement, right? So it it doesn't and. What puppies, what people don't talk about is the fact that the yip proceeds, I'm not going to engage with you for 30 seconds. It's the disengagement. The yip might be, you know, a momentary response to, ow, <laughs> right? But what follows it is, I'm not going to play with you for 30 seconds. It always follows it. It's not the yip that stops the behavior. It's the, I'm not going to play with you that stops the behavior. Right? So when you're thinking about a behavior and jumping up and mouthing are both in the same category, the dog is trying to get your intention and engage with you. So what you can use is when you do that, you're not going to get what you want. When you don't do that, you'll totally get what you want. <laughs> right? That's what it's about. Now, this doesn't work for counter surfing because if the dog jumps on the counter for rotisserie chicken and you leave the room, <laughs> right? Gets rotisserie chicken. <laughs> so leaving, turning your back is not the solution for everything. But for these behaviors whose intent is to get attention and interaction with you, that can be very, very powerful. Now one of the challenges you guys have in here is again, we have dogs who the loss of you might not mean that much. Oh, you turned your back. There's some dog pee over here, I'm going to snap. Right? That's another reason to establish connection with a marker so that people have value. So that when you choose to remove yourself, it matters. Right? Because remember, whether something is a reinforcer or a punisher, only the change in behavior tells you that. Right? That's the only thing that deter Did you see more of it than what the dog was getting paid with was a reinforcer. Did you see less of it? It was a punisher.